Hi everybody, we're going to continue the endocrine system by talking about the thyroid and parathyroid glands. If you have your course pack handy, please turn to page 9. We'll start there. Let's first talk about the thyroid gland and its location. The thyroid gland is a butterfly or bow tie shaped gland that wraps around the front and sides of the trachea. You can see in this image there's also four to eight nodules of parathyroid glands that wrap the back side of that thyroid gland. Now if someone is to have their thyroid gland removed, those parathyroid glands should not be brought along as well because that can cause problems with calcium regulation as we'll soon discuss. When we look inside the thyroid gland, we actually see follicle cells, parafollicular cells, and colloid. This particular gland is the largest purely endocrine gland in the body. Other glands are often mixed with other types of tissues. Now, to find the follicle cells, we look around the edges of the colloid. So in this area right through here, we find these follicle cells. I kind of think of this as looking at an aerial view of a bunch of lakes. These follicle cells make up the beaches for those lakes. Now, the colloid is this substance, gel-like substance, stored inside of that area, and we're going to find out that a hormone called thyroxine is stored there. The cells in between all of these follicle cells, let's draw some of those follicle cells there, are called parafollicular cells. So back in here, we have parafollicle or parafollicular cells. And so the reason we're looking at these two different types of cells is because they make two different types of hormones. We'll discuss those shortly. All right, so in this image here, you can see, again, the follicle cells that create a ring structure here. And we store thyroxine inside that, that colloid space. So it is the follicle cells that make thyroxine And we can store that thyroxine for about a month inside that colloid. Those parafollicular cells make another hormone that we call calcitonin. Okay, so parafollicular cells. They make a hormone called calcitonin. All right, so let's talk about thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone is actually a combination of two hormones, thyroxine, which is sometimes called T4, and triiodothyronine, which is sometimes called T3. Calcitonin is a separate hormone altogether. It regulates calcium levels in the bloodstream. We'll come back and talk about that in a few minutes. First, let's focus on those two thyroid hormones. T3 and T4 are thyroid hormones. They differ only by one iodine atom. T3 is triiodothyronine. It is less common, but T4 is more common, and it's called thyroxine. Now, when T4 travels the bloodstream, it is bound to a protein called thyroglobulin. When T4 is delivered to cells, it drops off an iodine atom, and it becomes T3 as it transitions into that cell's interior. Now, T3 is a more potent form of the thyroid hormone, but it happens to be a less common form of the thyroid hormone. So you're going to find more T4, but it just happens to be a less potent form. Okay, so iodine is a major component of these particular hormones. We do get iodine from our diet. We get it from seafood and from foods grown in the soils around our area. There are certain parts of the country, however, that are missing iodine. We'll talk more about goiters and how that's related to iodine in just a bit. So let's talk about thyroxine production. This is a great example of a hormonal stimulus. And what we're talking about is a negative feedback loop that originates with production of thyrotropic releasing hormone, or TRH, there's that reminder, that comes from the hypothalamus. TRH targets the anterior pituitary, which in turn releases thyroid stimulating hormone, or TSH. 
TSH targets the thyroid gland and in response the thyroid gland produces thyroxine. Now is thyroxine T4 or T3? It's T4. Okay, so that is the more common but less potent form of the thyroid hormone. So this particular feedback loop here is how we manage thyroxine levels in the body. The function of thyroid hormones T4 and T3 is to regulate the metabolism of our cells as well as the development of our cells. I am trying hard here not to use the word growth because growth of a cell is regulated by growth hormone. So I'm trying to focus your attention there on that word development. So development is different strictly from the growth or the increase in size of a cell. So we oftentimes think of the thyroid hormones as metabolic hormones. That's really gonna be the focus of how we think about thyroxine and triiodothyronine. So let's talk about T4 or thyroxine for just a moment. Thyroxine is released by the thyroid follicles. Keep in mind, it's the more um, common uh, but less potent form of that thyroid hormone. So thyroxine is gonna be traveling through the body by way of a transport protein called thyroglobulin. They are bound together. And when thyroxine arrives at our cells, it's converted to T3. Keep in mind, that's the more potent but less common form of this thyroid hormone. So let's spend some time talking about a few thyroid gland disorders. First, we're gonna talk about hypothyroidism conditions, which come from an insufficient level of thyroid hormones. Mixed edema, cretinism, or congenital hypothyroidism and goiter can be classified this way. We'll also talk about hyperthyroidism conditions, which results from excess thyroid hormones. Graves disease typically falls here, sometimes goiter falls here. First problem we're gonna talk about is called mixed edema. This particular condition affects adults and it comes from severe untreated hypothyroidism, which means too little thyroxine. The symptoms include everything from hair loss to dry skin, mental fog, can't cl uh, think clearly, a slow heart rate and weight gain. I actually have hypothyroidism, but my condition was not at this severe level at mixed edema. And it does have some of the similar uh, symptoms such as um, weight gain, fatigue, sometimes feeling like you're in a mental fog, kind of like when you wake up in the middle of a dream at night and can't figure out what's going on. And these two individuals, you'll notice the picture on the left is a lady with some swelling around her face. That's typical of mixed edema. Notice the man on the right has received treatment and he actually has lost some of that fluid and, and built up around his face. So mixed edema has the word edema built in there and swelling is a typical Thing that we see with this condition. The next condition is cretinism or congenital hypothyroidism. Nowadays, this particular condition is commonly referred to as congenital hypothyroidism. In fact, we now screen newborns on the day of their birth to see if they have adequate levels of thyroxine, and if they don't, they'll begin treatment that day. So this particular condition is a real problem for children because if left untreated, it can cause the body to be underdeveloped, weak muscles and bones, thick skin, mental retardation. So we tend to see dwarfism associated with this condition and mental retardation, but all of this can be helped if the person is given enough thyroxine as a treatment. So cretinism produces dwarfism. You see the uh, man in the middle there has around four foot range of height. All this has to do with the fact that thyroid hormone is not only important for metabolism, but also for development. So that's what we're seeing here in the case of someone who has grown up without adequate levels of thyroxine. This picture comes from a 1950s textbook and you'll notice this is a 16 year old female. She has not yet passed through puberty. But after two years of treatment, take a look at what's happened to her. She's passed her puberty. So we now understand that thyroxine is necessary as a permissive hormone. It allows sex hormones to be able to do their jobs. So remarkable changes can be seen in the human body during the time of growth when we uh, give enough thyroxine. 
Also, in this picture, the person on the far left has hypothyroidism, had, had it as a child, may also have it as an adult, and again, it produces dwarfism. Goiters can result from a lack of iodine in the diet or an iodine metabolism problem. So we know that T3 and T4, those numbers T3 and 4, come from the number of iodine atoms attached to those molecules. So when the, the thyroid gland is missing adequate iodine, it becomes larger and larger. Kind of think of it like an angry thyroid gland that's screaming for more iodine. So it enlarges because it's unable to concentrate an adequate level of iodine from the bloodstream. This is an interesting image to take note of. You'll notice the top portion of the United States is what we call the goiter belt, including those Great Lakes. In these areas of the US, there is an adequate level of iodine in the soil and in the water. So even fish caught in those Great Lakes may not carry enough iodine in order for a person to have normal thyroid function. About 100 years ago, we figured out there's a way around this problem, and that is with iodizing salt. So now if you look in the grocery store, there are two choices. There's iodized salt, which should meet your daily requirements for thyroid function. Then there's also the option to purchase non-iodized salt. So who might want to purchase non-iodized salt? Perhaps somebody with hyperthyroidism. So there are two choices there. Do take a look the next time you're grocery shopping for salt. So goiters can be treated by iodine if that is in fact the deficiency the person has. They can be treated with Synthroid or Levothyroxine. These are just two types of thyroid hormone supplements that may be given. If that doesn't work, then we can surgically remove the thyroid gland or there's a radioactive iodine pill that can be given to a person that kills the thyroid function. If we do either of these last two routes, then those people would have to then take Synthroid, Levothyroxine, or Unithroid, one of those synthetic hormones to help regulate and maintain thyroid functioning. Here's some images of goiter, and unfortunately, because it becomes enlarged, it can squeeze the airway since the trachea is wrapped by this thyroid gland. Looks like this person here has had a goiter removed. Let's talk about the opposite end of the spectrum, hyperthyroidism and Graves' disease. The way I keep this straight is Graves' disease can actually put you in the grave. You know, weight loss is one of the side effects here or symptoms of this particular condition, and that may be a, an attractive feature of having this problem, but oh gosh, no. Look what else it causes. What is tachycardia? That's high or fast heart rate. That can wear your heart out. That's why a person with Graves' disease can end up in the grave. We also see things like, you know, increased blood pressure. Okay, we see facial flushing that comes from increased body temp. We also see a problem here with these eyes. These bulging eyes can cause the eyes to be pushed out of the sockets while additional connective tissue grows behind them. So a lot of problems here can come from having too much thyroxine. So the, the spectrum here deals with opposite symptoms to uh, you know, myxedema. We're looking at fast heart rate, weight loss, heat insensitivity, and this condition here specifically to Graves' disease known as exothalamus. So let's take a look at that condition. These people have eyes that have been pushed out of their sockets due to excessive growth of connective tissue in those eye sockets. Unfortunately, this condition is not reversible. It can only be treated once a person has developed this uh, exothalamus condition. This particular condition is unique to Graves' disease, so keep in mind no other condition experiences this bulging eye syndrome. Here's a case where someone had her eyes sewn shut due to infection. The corneas can actually dry out during um, exothalamus. So this is not a desirable condition, obviously, for someone with Graves' disease. Just let you take a look here at this laundry list of problems that come with Graves' disease. All right, so let's now switch gears and talk about the last hormone on your page, that's page nine, calcitonin. 
Calcitonin is produced by the parafollicular cells, these cells here. So the name calcitonin has a built-in clue. This particular hormone lowers blood calcium by depositing excess blood calcium into the bones. Did you know that having too much blood calcium can be bad for your heart and your muscles? It's critical that this hormone helps to remove that extra calcium and put it into your bones where they can grow. All right, so calcitonin is stimulated when blood calcium levels are too high. This is a great example because we now have blood calcium levels that points us to a type of humoral stimulation. Let's talk about your parathyroid glands for just a moment. You'll need to flip on over to page 10 with me. The parathyroid glands are found in four to eight nodules of tissue on the posterior side of the thyroid gland. Now, if the thyroid is removed, we're going to have to be careful not to take the parathyroids because they regulate calcium as well. Easy thing to remember here, parathyroid glands make one hormone only, and that is called the parathyroid hormone, sometimes called parathormone or PTH for short. And these little nodules back here, those are the parathyroid hormone, or parathyroid gland, rather. Parathyroid has one function, and that is to increase blood calcium levels. Of course, this particular hormone is, again, another example of humoral control. Anytime we see a particular hormone produced in response to blood levels, whether it's ions like calcium or nutrients like glucose, we're going to classify that as humoral stimulation. So let's talk about the two other questions here. Breastfeeding affects PTH production because breast milk increases the amount of calcium in the breast milk. So if you need to increase blood calcium levels, you also need to in increase parathyroid hormone production. There's an old saying, it goes, for every child, a tooth is lost. So if mom is breastfeeding a baby, her teeth may get cavities, she may have teeth become loose, or even in some cases fall out. And that's because the calcium is being taken from anywhere in the body, bones and teeth included, to help nourish that breast milk for the baby. Moms actually lose around 2-3% to of their skeleton due to breastfeeding. Once moms stop breastfeeding, that calcium level will rebuild. You should know the answer to this question. We just covered the hormone that acts as an antagonist to calcitonin or to PTH is in fact calcitonin. Keep in mind it's produced by the thyroid gland sitting nearby. There are in fact three target organs of PTH. You can get uh, calcium levels from your bone. We probably knew that from Bio 210. But did you know you can also get calcium from the forming urine? You can pull calcium back into the bloodstream at your kidneys. Likewise, you can also get calcium from the foods that are being passed through your intestines. So there are three target organs of parathyroid hormone, bones, kidneys, and intestines. Just wanted to show you this interesting picture. In the case for hyperparathyroidism, you can see these glowing parathyroid glands, there's one faintly right there, on the neck area. This is the person's chin and the back of the head around here. So in the case of hyperparathyroidism, let's look at all the problems that result. The particular condition of hyperparathyroidism produces stones, bones, groans, and moans. Well, we're leaching calcium out of the body, putting it back into the bloodstream. That can lead to bone loss. That can cause kidney stones to form. That can cause psychiatric disturbances. That's the uh, groans and moans, right? And then we can also have abdominal cramping because we're pulling calcium from the forming food into the bloodstream. So this particular condition is caused by excess PTH. It can abnormally raise that blood calcium level to a point that can be problematic. Just another look here at hyperparathyroidism. And that should take us down to the bottom of page 10.